them, and we are now prepared for uh, opening statements. And uh, we will start with the state. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I give my opening statement, I want to take just a minute, and especially for the time, I would like to thank you for your service as jurors. We live in a tremendous country where we have so many freedoms. In return for those freedoms, there are very few things that are required as a citizen. We have to register for the draft. We have to pay our taxes, unfortunately, this time of year. Uh, and we have to serve as jurors for the whole time of this but even that, as jurors, if you're still in the last couple of days, if you really want to get out of jury service, you do. But you didn't do that. And for that, we thank you. If you have agreed to sit and fairly judge this case, please don't do this. Now, why are we here? We're here because on March 21st, 2017, Shaquille Williams pulled up to a stop sign at the intersection of Bush Street and Kingsley Road. Sunbury Village. And Sunbury Village is in Pemberley Township. When he pulled up to that stop sign, he was assassinated. There's no other way to put it. Because when he pulled up to that stop sign, he was approached by this man, Scott Lewis, and a second man by the name of Brandon Clifton. And when Doug Lewis and Brandon Clifton approached that car, they took out handguns and they fired 13 rounds into the driver's side of that vehicle. 13 rounds, 12 of those rounds entered the passenger compartment of that vehicle through the partially open driver's side window. One bullet struck the driver's side door frame, and you'll see that going towards this truck. Of the 12 bullets that entered in through that window, 11, 11 bullets hit Shaquille Williams. He was struck in the arm, the hand, the face, and the side and the back. He didn't have a chance. He was dead at the scene, still seated in the driver's side of that car. Now, when police get there, they assess his condition, they pull him out of the driver's side of the car, they give him CPR, but he was already gone. He was dead before they got there. At the time of the shooting, Shaquille Williams had a passenger in his vehicle by the name of Kahid Saru. Kahit Saruti was in that car, in the passenger yeah. seat, when those bullets entered that car. And, and one of those bullets that entered into that passenger compartment grazed him in the leg. Even though he was grazed in the leg, he was able to exit the car and run from the scene. He runs down Kingsley Road. And how do we know that? The evidence will show you why we know that. But he runs down Kingsley Road, and police eventually catch up to him. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. As a result of this incident that occurred, Doug Lowe and Brandon Clifton were charged in an indictment, and the indictment, as the judge just stated, is not evidence. It's a charging document. They were charged with the murder of Shaquille Williams. They were charged with conspiracy to commit murder, possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. They used it against the person of Shaquille Williams. And they were charged with unlawful possession of weapons. You can't carry a uh, and they were charged with aggravated assault for the wounding of Kahit Saru. For legal reasons, <laughs> the cases against uh, Doug Lewis and Brandon Clifton have been set for separate. They're going to be tried separately. You as jurors only need to consider the case against Doug Lewis. Brandon Clifton will be dealt with at a later time. I understand what happened that night. We have to take a look at the area. We have to take a look at what Sunbury Village is, what, what type of neighborhood it is. And Sunbury Village is a housing development in the area of Pemberton Township that's seen its share of problems. Police officers will tell you it's pretty active for them in that area. There's been problems. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And on March 21st, 2017, the victim, Shaquille Williams, had just gotten back from a rehab center. He spent about a month in Florida at a drug rehab center because he was addicted to heroin. March 21st, 2017 was his first day back from rehab in the state of New Jersey. During the course of this trial, you're going to hear that that rehab attempt by Shaquille Williams wasn't too successful. 
Because on that night, March 21st, 2017, Shaquille Williams was right back in Sunbury Village looking to buy heroin. And when he went back into Sunbury Village, he made contact with his friend, Kahid Saruti. He went over to Kahid Saruti's house. Kahid lived on Lemon Avenue, which is on the back street in Sunbury Village. He made contact with Kahid at his house. And when he got there, he found Kahid outside smoking cigarette. And also with Kahid was Shaquille Williams' sister. And Shaquille Williams didn't want his sister to know he was back in Sunbury to purchase heroin. So what he did was he called Kahid over to his car. Kahid comes over to the car. Shaquille indicates he wants to go buy some heroin. Kahid gets in the car with him, and the two drive off. When they drive off, Shaquille Williams hands Kahid $22 in cash. And it's agreed that Kahid is going to make the purchase of heroin for them. And in return for making that purchase, Kahid's going to get some of those drugs. When they drive off, they go through Sunbury Village, they stop at a house in front of the house, Kahid gets out of the car, goes up to that house, and attempts to make the purchase of heroin. He's unsuccessful at that time. So what happens? Kahid gets back into Shaquille's car, gets in the passenger seat, and Shaquille drives off again. Two men are still searching to buy heroin. When they drive off this time, They're going through Sunbury Village. And in Sunbury Village, Shaquille Williams was well known. And he wasn't welcomed in Sunbury Village by a certain group of people in that area. Because that group of people believed that Shaquille Williams, a couple months prior, had robbed or stolen some property from an individual by the name of Shaquille Crow. They didn't like Shaquille Williams. And they were upset that he was driving around that area. So on March 21st, 2017, after they make that first attempt to buy heroin at the house, they're driving around Sunbury Village, and they get to the area of 141 Kingsley Road. And in Sunbury Village, the houses are attached. They're ranch-style houses, but they're two attached to each other. So 141 and 143 are just one long house, but they're separated in the middle. It's, it's like row houses, but they're not up and down. They're just ranch houses. They get to 141 or the area of 141 Kingsley, and there's a large group of people out front. So Shaquille Williams pulls up to that large group of people, and he Saruti gets out of the car, and one of the people in that large group is that man, Doug Lewis. Doug Lewis knows Kahit Saruti. Doug Lewis knows Shaquille Williams. When Kahit Saruti gets out of the car, Doug Lewis approaches him. He taps him up. Goes and greets him. They shake hands, they converse. After he's done greeting Kahit Saruti, Doug Lewis goes around to the driver's side of the car. And when he goes around to the driver's side of the car, he observes Shaquille Williams, who he's known for a long period of time. He knows who he is, they've been friendly before. Um, and when he meets Shaquille Williams, he greets him, they converse for a while, they talk. And then Kahit Saruti has made his purchase of heroin, so he gets back in the car, and Shaquille Williams drives off. When the two men drive off, they first intend to go back to Kahit's house, Lemon Avenue, and snort the heroin that he purchased. But when they get back to Lemon Avenue, they realize they have a problem, because when they get back to Kahit's house, Shaquille's sister is still out of the phone. Shaquille Williams doesn't want her to know. He's relapsed, he's back to the music heroin. So what does he do? They just keep driving. They do what's, you know, it's like a figure eight around Sunbury Bill. That's how the road's laid out. So they go around and they drive around uh, Sunbury Village. Shaquille gets to the intersection of Bush Street and Kingsley Road. There's a stop sign there, and you'll see the photographs. And when they get to that stop sign, Shaquille Williams stops the car, and when he stops the car at that intersection, they decide they're going to do the heroin right then and there. They divvy up the heroin, and as they're about to snort the heroin, Doug Lewis and Brandon Clifton run up to that car. They pull out handguns, and both of them fire those 13 rounds into that car. Doug Lewis has already seen who's driving that car. He knows exactly who's driving. 
not only that, that's exactly where they run up to. They run up to the driver's side of that car, which is sitting, and they fire those rounds into that car. As I said, Shaquille Williams was struck multiple times. You'll see photographs of those injuries that were inflicted upon him. You'll hear the testimony of the medical examiner as to the damage that those bullets caused. The medical examiner will tell you what the cause and the manner of death was, and you'll see that to have that during the course of this trial. After Lewis clipped and fired those 13 rounds into that car, they run from the scene. When they run from the scene, there are a lot of people out there. But as I said, Sunbury Village has had to share a problem. So not everybody's off. They run from the scene. Some people have heard what's happened. People have seen what's happened. Some of those people do agree to talk. One of those individuals was a lot He was out there that day, he was on the street, and that night he told police what happened, and he later gave a tape statement about what happened. Brown told officers that he saw Saruti during the course of the night. He saw Saruti get into the dark colored vehicle, which he was. He saw them driving around Sunbury Village. He saw Shaquille's car come to the stop at that stop sign. When he saw the vehicle come to the stop at the stop sign, Brown will tell you that he saw an individual he knew as Doug Lewis, as well as another man, run up to that car. And when they ran up to that car, they opened fire into the driver's side of that car. Brown will tell you he heard at least 10 shots, but no more than 14. He doesn't get an exact reference. 10 or 14 shots. He also told police that he saw Kahit Saruti after the shooting get out of that car and run from the scene. The other interesting thing that Lamont Brown saw was he saw Doug Lois run away after shooting and firing shots into that car. And he describes what Doug Lois is wearing. He calls it a jean suit, where he's wearing his blue jeans and a jean jacket. And you'll see a photograph of that for he says he sees Lewis and the other individual run away from the scene, and he eventually sees Doug Lewis run back around into what he describes as Manny's house. Okay. And police know Manny lives right down the street from where this shooting happened. There's an individual by the name of Manny that lives at 141 Kingsley Road. This shooting happens in front of 135, I believe it is, Kingsley Road. It's like 100 yards away. Brown tells police that Lewis ran into that house, and police, as they're processing the scene, basically put a perimeter around the house, making sure nobody leaves at that point. It takes the police a little bit of time to get there, but once they're there, and once they speak, spoken to Brown, they cordon off this area. Now, several hours later, Doug Lewis comes out of 141 Kingsley Road. When he comes out, the police come up to him. They take him back to the police station. At the police station, they advise him of his Miranda warnings, and he agrees to speak to the police. And he gives a statement, and I'm going to talk about that statement, and he also does something else. Because at the station, what happens is uh, one of the prosecutor's agents, John Gorkowski, takes swabs of Doug Lewis's hands, the back of his hands and the palm of his hands. And the reason he's doing that is he's making a kit that tests for gunshot residue. And I'm going to talk more about the gunshot residue kit and Doug Lewis's initial statement to police a little later. But now I want to talk about the processing of the scene, the crime scene. After the police get there, they set up the perimeter. They're watching 141 Kingsley. And they're also collecting evidence and checking the scene. And when they do that, they find multiple pieces of ballistics evidence around that car. In fact, they find 13 shell casings around that car. One is on the roof, and there's a bunch around the driver's side of the car extending to the back of the car. They're all on the driver's side, exactly where Lamont Brown says that these individuals ran up. Those 13 shell casings are subsequently sent to the New Jersey State Police Ballistics Lab. They're compared to one another, and when they're compared to one another, 
Nine of those shell casings were determined to have come from one single weapon. They match. The markings on the shell casings from being fired from the gun indicate that those nine casings are fired from that one gun. The other four casings of the 13 were also examined. They were examined for all the other shell casings. And when they were examined, those four additional shell casings were determined to have come from a second gun. They match. There are two separate guns in the shooter. There were multiple shooters in this case. Additionally, police search some of the properties around the area. There's an abandoned house at 137-139 Kingsley Road. Police search that abandoned house. And when they search that abandoned house, they find a plastic bag in the back shed. They open that plastic bag, and lo and behold, there's a handgun. They sent that handgun up to the New Jersey State Police Lab, along with the shell casings that I just talked about. What they do when they get to the state police lab is the uh, examiner will test fire that weapon. They'll use similar ammunition to the shell casings that were found at the scene. He'll fire that gun several times. He'll collect those cases. And what he did with those collect, uh, collected casings from that test fired gun was he compared them to the 13 shell casings that were found at the scene. And when he did that, it was determined that those shell casings, those test shell casings from that pistol that was found, did not match any of those 13 shell casings. And what that led him to conclude was that gun was not used in the murder of Shaquille Williams. That gun had nothing to do with this case. The two murder weapons that were used to kill Shaquille Williams were never recovered. The fact that the murder weapons were never recovered, however, has no bearing in this case whatsoever. We know from the ballistics evidence found by the car, from the bullets pulled from the body of Shaquille Williams, from the nature of his injuries, from the medical examiner's testimony, that Shaquille Williams was shot to death. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt from the fact that there are two different types of shell casings. The evidence will show there are two, two separate shooters. And the evidence will further establish during the course of this trial that Doug Lewis and Brandon Clifton were those two shooters. So the fact that no murder weapon was found doesn't matter for this case. I can shoot somebody and still be guilty of the shooting even though you don't find that gun. I can still be guilty of the possession of that weapon because at the time I fired that gun, I was in possession of that weapon, even if police never find that gun. And I just want to make that clear up front that the recovery of the weapon does not, is not required for conviction. Another thing that the police find at the scene is they look at a blood trail. The blood trail leads from the passenger side of that car down Kingsley Road. The police observe the trail, they follow the trail, and eventually they find Kahit Sarudi. And when they find Kahit Sarudi, he has a grazed wound to his leg. He was seated in the passenger seat of that car, and he has a bullet injury Raising to his leg. Unfortunately, when the police find Kahit Sarudi, he's not real cooperative. He doesn't want to tell the police what happened. He doesn't want to tell them who shot him. Remember, Kahit Sarudi lives in Sunbury Village. Sunbury Village is where the shooters hang out. Kahit Sarudi was in that car next to Shaquille Williams, and Shaquille Williams was shot multiple times in that car. The shooters, we're there when Kahit Sarudi gets out of that car and runs. They know who he is and where he is. That may be the reason why he's not as cooperative. There's another individual that was on location that night, though, by the name of Mark Quan McQuitt. Mark Quan McQuitt will tell you he got to Sunbury Village sometime that day and was there all day through the night. He was out on the streets when he saw the shooting. He will tell you that while he was there, right before the shooting, he observed several individuals out on the street, and one of those individuals was Doug Lewis. At one point, he sees Doug Lewis and another individual run up to the intersection of Bush and Kingsley. When Doug Lewis and this other individual get up to the intersection of Bush and Kingsley, he sees them fire multiple shots into the car that's parked at that stop sign. He even indicates that Doug Lewis was the first to open fire. 
He knew Doug Lewis. He knew the people in San Bernardino. He was aware of them. After the shooting stops, Marquand McQuitted indicates that he sees an individual known to him to be Kaid Saruti. He had a passenger side of the car and run from the scene. Okay. As I told you, March 21st into the early morning hours of March 22nd, Doug Lewis comes out of 141 Kingsley Avenue, or I'm sorry, Kingsley Road. Police come up to him, they bring him back to the police station. When they get it back to the police station, they Mirandize him. And this is just hours after the murder of Shaquille Williams. They get it back to the police station, Mirandize him, and he agrees to give a, a statement, and a statement that will be played for you in court. And in that statement, there's some very interesting things. This is not a confession, it's not somebody breaking down and confessing to the crime, but he says some very interesting things uh, right after the murder. Again, hours after the crime. In that initial statement, he says, I know Shaquille Williams very well, I've known him for years. On March 21st, 2017, I never saw Shaquille Williams that night. Didn't see him at all. In fact, I haven't seen him for at least a month. Then he says, I didn't even know Shaquille Williams was the one that got shot 100 yards away. Didn't even know it was him. Well, I read about it on Facebook. In fact, he says, when Shaquille Williams gets shot to death, I wasn't even outside. I was inside 141 Kings Road. I was inside the house. Not only was I inside the house, but I was in the living room of the house. I wasn't outside. He also says he was in Sunbury Village from about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and that he got to Sunbury Village because he drove in his car, BMW. 645 the model numbers correct that he says. He drives to Sunbury Village in that car and parks in the driveway. And then he says, well, it wasn't Manny's driveway, it was the driveway next door, but 141, 143. It was in one of the driveways of those residences. Then he tells police, even though he drove there, he called his girlfriend to come pick him up after the shooting. He also told police, I never fired a gun that day. And in fact, I never even touched a gun like that. When he's done giving his statement, as I told you, John Gorkowski from the prosecutor's office comes and swaps his hands. Gorkowski submits that kit, that gunshot residue kit, to a private, independent laboratory. And a forensic scientist from that laboratory who will testify during the course of this trial examine that kit. And she'll testify to you about what she found. But what she found was gunshot residue on the hands of that man, Doug Lewis. Those swabbings were taken just hours after this crime. Hours after guns were fired into that car. And Doug Lewis has gunshot residue on the hands. And during the course of this trial, as I stated, she'll testify and she'll tell you what she found, what the significance of those findings were, and what it means for this case. The statement that Doug Lewis gave on March 22nd, 2017, hours after the crime, was not the only statement he gave. Because 17 months later, 17 months after the shooting, on August 31st, 2018, Doug Lewis gave a second statement to police. And this work gets interesting. So they said, no confession, but compare the two statements and join your own conclusions. Because on October, or I'm sorry, on August 31st, 2018, Doug Lewis gives details of the night of the shooting that are completely inconsistent with what he told police just hours after the shooting. And you'll hear both statements. And when you hear both statements, ask yourself, why are there major inconsistencies? And I'm not talking about little details, little minor things that people could get wrong. This is a major event. A hundred yards away from you, there's a shooting where somebody dies. Think about the major details of that that we get wrong. Draw your conclusions from that, those inconsistencies. Because on August 31st, he tells police that on March 21st, 2017, just before 9 o'clock in the evening, he's out on the streets in Sunbury Village, 
Bushing, near Bushing, England. And when he's out at that location, he sees a car pull up with Kahit Sarudi in the passenger seat. Kahit Sarudi gets out of the car, and Doug Lewis says to the police, I went up and I greeted Doug Lewis. Or, I'm sorry, I greeted Kahit Sarudi. I tapped him up, I talked to him, conversed with him, and then when I was done talking to him, I went around to the driver's side of that vehicle, officer. I, I went over there, and I spoke to the driver. Why didn't we shoot Kill Williams? Now, all of a sudden, in August, August 31st, 2018, I went over to that driver's side and I greeted Shaquille Williams. And I talked to him. I conversed with him. I've known him for a long time. And I had a conversation with him. It's a big difference from what he told police right after the shooting. Right after the shooting, you will hear the statement where he says, I know Shaquille, but I didn't see him that night. Didn't see him that night, haven't seen him in a month. Now, 17 months later, not only did I see him, but I talked to him right before the shooting. When you hear these two statements, ask yourself, why is this major inconsistency there? And the reason is because on March 22nd, 2017, he had to distance himself from the murder of Shaquille Williams. And the way he distanced himself is to just say, I didn't see him that way. Now, 17 months later, he's aware that maybe somebody saw me outside. Maybe I gotta change that. Maybe I was, you know, I was outside of the talk. But I didn't shoot. Didn't do it. In the second statement, Doug Lewis initially says, Well, I was outside on the porch of Manny's house when the shooting happened. He said initially. Then a little later on in the statement, he changes that I was on the porch to I was in the street and I was making my way back towards the porch when gunshots rang. That's not what he says in the first statement. In the first statement, I was in the house. I was in the living room, not even outside. Again, he knows people have been interviewed, he knows people have been talking. Maybe somebody says I'm outside, so I've got to justify that. In his first statement, his initial thought is, I got to just distance this. Where he is consistent, though, in the August 31st statement, he says, I never fired a gun that day, I never touched a gun that day. And you'll hear one of the detectives in that interview says, well, Tuesday, March 21st, 2017, you didn't touch a gun, didn't fire it. Nope, didn't, didn't touch, didn't fire Then she goes backwards, five days. And on each day, Doug Lewis says, nope, never fired a gun that day, never touched a gun that day. Because he can't admit he had a gun that day. He's lying. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will establish that he's lying because he has gunshot residue on his hands just after the homicide, and he can't explain it. He can't explain it away. He's given multiple opportunities, and you'll hear those statements, to explain the gunshot residue, and he can't. He got on his hands when he opened fire on Shaquille Williams, killed him. Why is he changing his story? Ask yourself that. Now, Mr. Riley is an excellent attorney, and I'm sure he's going to try to discredit the state's witnesses, especially the eyewitnesses, Lamont Brown and Marquand McQuitt. And it's true. Lamont and Marquand have had their run-ins with the law. They've had problems. They've had drug problems in their past. But that, in and of itself, does not mean they are not credible witnesses. You have to judge the credibility, as the judge told you, based on all of the factors that are at your disposal. And you do it like you do every single day in your life. For those of you who have kids, if you have a child, you bake a chocolate cake, you put the chocolate cake out on the counter, and you walk away for a few minutes with your five-year-old in the room, you come back, the cake's a mess. You say to your five-year-old, did you, did you eat cake? He says, no, I didn't touch the cake. But he's got chocolate all over his mouth and his hands. You can judge the credibility of that person. The same is true for you. If the witnesses are consistent with each other in the major details, if the witnesses corroborate the physical evidence as they do here, then you can judge your credibility and tell the truth. In this case, both witnesses corroborate one another and they corroborate the physical evidence. Both witnesses tell you, or will tell you, that there were multiple shooters in this case. And we know that's a fact as well, and you we'll see the evidence. There are 13 shell cases on the ground. Nine come from one gun, four come from another. There were multiple shooters. They will tell you the shooters went up to the car, stopped right behind the driver's side window, and opened fire. The 
evidence will corroborate that. The window of that car was partially down. Out of the 13 shots, 12 of them went through that open window. That window's not broken. Those victims are shot. Goes right through. So to do that with a handgun, you have to be pretty darn close. And it's exactly what the witnesses tell you, and that's what the evidence will tell you. The bullets are also all on the driver's side, going back to the back of the car. It's consistent with what the witnesses say. Physical evidence matches. They also both indicate to you, or will indicate to you, without question, that Doug Lewis was one of the shooters. This is the same Doug Lewis that they observed running up to the car and opening fire. The same Doug Lewis that has gunshot residue on his hands. And the same Doug Lewis that tells two different versions of events. That's the major details of all of these statements. Witnesses are consistent because they're telling you the truth. You don't lie to get into trouble, you lie to get out of trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, just before 9 p.m. on the night of March 21st, 2017, Doug Lewis ran up to Shaquille Williams' car as it sat idling, idling in the intersection of Bush and Kingsley. When he ran up to that intersection with Brandon Clifton, both men pulled out handguns and they fired 13 rounds into that car. Into the driver's side of that car with Doug Kerr, where Shaquille Williams was seated, striking him numerous times, killing him almost immediately. When you fire 13 rounds into a car at that close a range to a person who's stationary, seated in a car with no place to go, it's clear you can only have one purpose. And that purpose was to kill Shaquille Williams. He knew from his, Douglas knew from his contact with Shaquille that Shaquille was going to be driving that car. He ran right up to the driver's side with his co-defendant, and that's when they opened fire. They wanted to make sure that Shaquille Williams was good to death. And that's exactly what they did that night. That was their purpose, and they succeeded in fulfilling that purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, when you review the evidence that's presented by the way of testimony and the physical evidence and exhibits that are presented in this case, and you review those items in conjunction with the law, as Judge Copeland instructs you at the end of the case, and you do that using a common sense approach, it will enable you to hold Doug Lewis accountable for his actions on March 21st, 2017. And when you hold him accountable, you will find him guilty of the murder of Shaquille Williams and the related offenses. I want to thank you for your time. Mr. Thank you very much.